At a time of deep division in today's society, we must come together for humanity's sake. On Can We Talk 360, we strive to stimulate an authentic conversation on issues that affect all of us in an environment of tolerance. I am Eugene Pettis, attorney and community servant. Tune into our discussion to foster a greater awareness of yourself and others. Let's discover how there is strength in our differences and an abundance of possibilities when we stand together as one humanity. Welcome to this episode of Can We Talk 360. I'm excited to have as our guest this afternoon, Dr. Michael Butler. Dr. Butler is a distinguished, uh, the Keenan Distinguished Professor of History at Flagler College in St. Augustine. Uh, he has credentials that I think you're gonna be most impressed with. He's a professor of history. He's the director of African American Studies program at that college. He's had a rich and long history uh, of looking at just not at America's history, but looking at various component parts, African American history, Southern culture, the civil rights movement, the Jim Crow era, slavery in the United States, and so many other aspects of our history. And he's brought a, he, he's brought a very, very learned uh, eye towards what's going on with our current uh, uh, society, largely in talking about critical race theory. Uh, welcome to our program, uh, Doctor. Thank you so much for having me, Mr. Pitts. I'm looking forward to the, the conversation. The, the uh, I learned of you in reading, um, I think it was CNN or some news outlet, in which I saw an article uh, that, that was, was an article that talked about the Osceola County School District had canceled one of your lectures uh, because they felt that it violated uh, uh, the critical, they had concerns of the impact over critical race theory, despite the fact that I understand nothing in your topic had anything to do with critical race theory per se. Right. Um, uh, and, and I was intrigued by that. And this is such uh, a hot issue, if you will, in our society. So I want to go and talk about that topic, both historically I want to talk about where do you believe the origins of this critical race theory debate, where the origins are, uh, how it's impacting our education of our children, uh, both at a K through 12 level and onward, and the impact that's having on society. So this afternoon, uh, I want to, to have a conversation with you to really pull from you your deep experience of history and your, uh, your, 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 your ideas of how this critical race theory uh, discussion is, 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 is really unfolding before our eyes. Um, first of all, give us uh, your definition and understanding what critical race theory is. When we hear that term, most people don't understand what it means. How would you define it to the, the average layperson? Yeah, great question. Uh, the definition that I tend to go with Mr. Pettis, is that critical race theory is an intellectual framework that's used to explain how the legacies of history continue to affect legal policies today. That simple. A legal framework, an intellectual framework, typically taught in law schools about how American history and the legacies of our history have influenced and continue to influence policies and practices today. The leading story, I guess, where, where I came to your attention um, with the Osceola County situation is really interesting. And I think it, it, it puts us at the center of what the real life practical applications of mislabeling, I, I would say intentionally mislabeling concepts and theories is for the future of educators in this state and the nation as a whole. Um, you see, uh, to back up a little bit, it wasn't just a seminar that, uh, that I was putting on, Mr. Pettis. It was a seminar that was sponsored by the National Council of History Educators. So one of the biggest organizations 
that provides teacher training and educational programming for teachers across the nation. Well, I've worked with our Florida chapter before in doing workshops and seminars and things of that nature on the civil rights movement, because that's really my area of specialty. Uh, American history, Southern history, civil rights, and how the Southern struggle reflects and has influenced our nation's history as a whole. Um, they gave me the great honor of reaching out and asking if I would be interested in being what they called the lead scholar for a section of a program that these teachers had been involved in in almost two years. They were at the civil rights section and in preparation for a field trip they were taking to Alabama, which is where I'm from, and for Black History Month, they wanted to do, in January 2022 of this year, they wanted to do a seminar on civil rights history. Well, I, they, they put me as the quote-unquote lead scholar, uh, a, a very flattering title, uh, with a what they call a master teacher, which is somebody who actually teaches in the school district on how to bring in the practical teaching of the history that I discussed. So in terms, uh, well over uh, a two month period and sort of bouncing ideas off the National Council of History Educators, the, the thing that I came up with was a three part seminar for the day. It was titled, The Long Civil Rights Movement. And the emphasis of all three panels, Mr. Pettis, was to have the teachers lead with the understanding that the movement cannot be reduced to one period or one person. That as the freedom song goes, freedom is a constant struggle, right? So the first part of this trilogy of sorts, of lectures, was titled The Long Civil Rights Movement, and I introduced that idea of a long civil rights movement to them. But look, because we're teaching history, it is a fact-based chronological presentation. So I start Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. If you want to understand what the movement responded to, you have to set the context. You have to set the historical precedent. And what they were, were responding to in the 50s and 60s was codified racism, which began with Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896. So chronologically speaking, then we went through World War II. The second part of that three-part lecture day was called the Master Narrative. Now, the Master Narrative is sort of like the greatest hits version of the Civil Rights Movement, right? The, uh, um, my, my parents used to listen to a lot of different music, and, and they would introduce to me Four Tops, Jackson 5, whatever the case may be, with the Greatest Hits compilation. So the Master Narrative is that greatest hits of... Brown v. Board, Montgomery, the bus boycott, Dr. King, Rosa Parks, Little Rock, Greensboro Sidians, all the way through the civil passage of the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts, right? The third part of the series was titled The Movement Continues. Because what I wanted to emphasize there as part of the long civil rights movement is that the movement doesn't end when laws are passed. The movement didn't end when Dr. King is murdered. The movement carries on into, yes, all of those things. But the legacies of injustice, the historical legacies and consequences of racism are not ended by the passage of laws. And, you know, your legal background, that's where I introduced the concepts of de facto versus de jure forms of segregation, right? And we go into that, and I kind of conclude with my own research on Pensacola, Florida, and the book that I wrote, which really emphasized that in the 1970s in Pensacola, their greatest civil rights period was roughly from 1973 to 1978, and it pertained to the presence of Confederate monuments in public spaces, and Confederate iconography in a local high school. So in other words, the movement continues. That was the package. And literally two days before we were supposed to have the seminar, 
I was informed by the National Council of History Educators that they had been in touch with Osceola County uh, Board of Education, and they had said that the title, Mr. Pettis, just the title, quote unquote, raises red flags. The title being the long civil rights movement raises red flags about the nature of the topic in light of the conversations we're having at the local and state levels about critical race theory. So they made the connection themselves that civil rights equals critical race theory. And not just for a professor coming in and indoctrinating our kids that are second, third, and fourth graders, but a teacher training seminar. I didn't know that CRT stood for civil rights training, but I learned through this experience that that's also what it refers to. The... Uh, uh... That one, that, that's one of the questions I was going to ask you, Dr. Butler, is that uh, how can critical race theory uh, and the current state law that Governor DeSantis has pushed through uh, wipe out a educational discussion of civil rights and the civil rights movement? You know, how... If we can't talk about that part of history, which is truly one of our better chapters from whence we've come, if we can't talk about the way it was and the way through the civil rights movement, we became a better society, right. what, you know, it, it, it's, what can we talk about? How can we just write that out of our history? Uh, did you get any answers when you were told you cannot, you know, Thank you, but no thank you. Your invitation on this topic is being revoked. Uh, did you talk to anybody as to how that topic sent out off red flags about critical race theory? Well, that's a great question because um, in a word, no. No one from the school district ever contacted me directly. No one saw my slides for the PowerPoints which are quite disappointing because it's just a picture and a title, right? Um, no one from Osceola County Board of Education ever contacted me directly to ask questions or request information about the topics that I intended to discuss. No one. It wow. was the title alone. Now, during that very week, I believe, earlier that week, was when our governor in Florida had actually passed the law against critical race theory being taught in classes. Look, that was a law that was passed for a problem that does not exist, quite frankly. A um, it, 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 is, it is modern day McCarthyism. You know, it is, we have a problem that we want to use to uh, really inflame our political base. It's the culture wars of 2022, right? And critical race theory was the new boogeyman, thanks to Christopher Rufo and uh, you know his ilk taking a law school specific educational ideology and misguiding it, mischaracterizing it, and using it for political purposes. Yeah. So, and, and you know, at the state level, that was the point. It was used, it was vaguely defined intentionally, I would argue, so that its application caused confusion, anger, and reaped political benefits for the people who made these laws at the local level. Um, when you don't know what something is, then any, you know, it's left to your imagination, then what does it actually become? And it's something that Kimberly Crenshaw calls definitional theft. You take a concept, you define it in your own narrow ways. You project some asinine outcome and you use it to strengthen your political base. And that's exactly what, what is happening in the state of Florida. You know, looking at uh, House Bill 7, which is individual freedoms, that's what it's right. titled, individual freedom. And, and in part, it talks about provides that subjecting individuals to specific concept un concepts under certain circumstances 
constitutes discrimination based on race, color, sex, or national origin, revising uh, requirements for required instruction of the history of African Americans, requiring the department to prepare and offer certain standards, and it goes on. And it prohibits the instructional materials uh, uh, reviewers from recommending instructional materials to contain any matter that contradict, contradicts certain principles. And it's just ironic that when you look at the title, individual freedom, that's such a, a, a powerful word. We heard that word in the mass mandates. You know, I have my individual freedoms. It's ironic that somehow with Roe versus Wade, individual freedoms are put you know, secondary, uh, we, it, you know, the, the, our society dialogue that's taking place is so inconsistent. Uh, we want to talk about individual freedoms when it's in my favor, but not talk about individual freedoms when it's somebody else's freedoms that I want to take away. Uh, that's when I have a right to take away your freedoms. Uh, it, it's just, I find that type of logic or illogic uh, to just be you use the word very mischaracterizing of what this is all about. Uh, well, this is a, a strategy that's straight out of Richard Nixon's playbook, right? You label a potentially controversial bill the opposite of what it does, right? And when it comes to the culture wars since 2016, and there's a very specific reason I use 2016 as the benchmark, but this idea of, of using the culture wars to inflame and labeling it liberty or freedom or patriot or anti-indoctrination, um, it's this is the definitional theft that we have to deal with, right? We have to be very, very aware that words, phrases, and definitions matter. And we have to be deliberate in the way that we accept that because I reject the premise that being able to teach our history, warts and all, is prohibited due to reasons of individual liberty. It's, it's asinine, but that sort of red meat for a certain political ideology does pay off. And that's why politicians at the local, state, and federal levels are incentivized to make their constituents fearful and angry because people vote when they're afraid and they're mad. And so you can mislabel the teaching of history. And with the definition that you read of the, the House bill, every word had multiple meanings. It's so vague. The vagueness is the point. It's so that you can label something problematic without actually saying what's problematic about what it is you're trying to label. Exactly. And, and it's just it, it, it leaves it so, you know, there's a part of the law that's, if it's too vague, then it's constitutionally challengeable. But in this instance, it is absolutely vague and subjective. When you're talking about what makes people uncomfortable, you can't make people uncomfortable. Well, your definition of what makes you uncomfortable is probably different than mine and vice versa, you know, on and on and on. You can't use such vague terms to guide a policy, or at least you shouldn't be able to use such guide, uh, uh, great terms to guide a policy. And that's what we've done in this particular case. Uh, and, you, you, you know, it was a quote, and I was trying to, to find it from um, uh, President, President Trump uh, that and, uh, talked about uh, basically... It's a issue of national security. And those are his terms. That if we don't get uh, critical race theory out of our schools, then you know, we're gonna lose our children. And it's a matter of national security. Yeah. I mean, if that's not a, uh, a, a, a dog whistle, I don't know what is that he, he creates. He creates that this big evil in society is happening because we're teaching holistic history of the country as opposed to the books as it used to be when I was in school in the 60s and 70s. 
it didn't have anything in there about black history and people of history. color. That's what they want. That's, and, that's the, you know, it's perfectly acceptable if we teach one version of history. Now, this is from the party that opposes indoctrination, right? They want to go to a history that stresses American exceptionalism, this idea that America is different, it's unique, it's exceptional, i.e., let's, let's, again, let's define our words carefully. The teaching of American exceptionalism is a teaching of American superiority. And when you teach your history as one of a trajectory toward constant improvement, then how can you explain what the civil rights movement was? Uh, you know, like you, one of the things that fascinates me about the civil rights movement. One reason that a, a white guy from South Alabama became interested in this history is, number one, I didn't know anything about it. It was not taught in public schools in Alabama, right? Um, but number two, how in a country where we give at least lip service to the values of freedom, equality, and justice for all, how can we have a period in our history for so long where we validated giving those rights equally to people simply because of a characteristic that they had no control over. The fact that local people, the fact that organizations, the fact that people in places like St. Petersburg and St. Augustine, Mobile, Alabama, Pensacola, Florida, that they said, no, they wanted and expected better from their country and win, that's the most quintessential American story, right? of how you can use the process of our democracy, how you can use the promises of democracy and demand better of your country. Now, yeah, there's progress, there's legal progress, there's a long way to go, but that's the most quintessential story of American democracy that we can tell. So yeah, when you teach that, um, American exceptionalism is what we're building toward, and we are on a path of constant improvement, then the darker periods in our history, and there are many, don't fall into that realm. The other thing, you know, back to your point about how this won't hold up in a court of law, of course it won't. There are challenges now legally from groups like the ACLU that are launching uh, or are being launched against things like the Critical Race Theory Act, the Don't Say Gay Bill, but that's not the point. The point is not the legality of these decrees. It's the fact that you are having the fight at all. It's going to pay dividends for these politicians in the short term, and they don't care about what the long-term consequences are because they're not going to be here to deal with those. You're, you're, you're spot on. You're, you're absolutely spot on, which is one of our most uh, talking about national security, I think that's the threat of national security, uh, that any, they'll say and do anything for political gain. Uh, and that's somewhere we lost the statesmen and stateswomen who yeah. were, whatever party they were, they were there for the better good. And right. now we're in a chapter of this country that's just individual gain, insult, whatever. I should have mentioned uh, uh, Dr. Butler uh, that you're among many other things, you're an author. You, you, you wrote The Victory After the Fall, The Memories of the Civil Rights Activist, H.K. Matthews. You uh, also authored as recent as, as May 16, Beyond Integration, The Black Freedom Struggle in Escambia County, uh, Florida, which is Pensacola, uh, from 1960 to 1980 that you referenced a little earlier. Uh, what has, you know, you, you grew up in Alabama, you were not taught this history. What stoked your passion? Because I can tell you're passionate about these topics uh, into your profession, into what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis uh, across this country. Well, number one, I, I think that the greatest compliment that I can ever receive is when someone says, I can tell that you're passionate about or love what you're doing, and I absolutely do. Um, you know, that's, that's a really deep question, Mr. Pettis. Um, I think maybe the first part of that is when you are not taught all sides of history, you fall for the okie doke. You believe the myth. You fall for the nostalgia. And nostalgia is not history. So 
what I thought I knew about the Confederacy, what I thought I knew about the Civil War, what I thought I knew about race relations, what I thought I knew about this country's history as a history major, I found in graduate school to be completely uninformed. And when I say uninformed, I mean not that I was misled, but that I was just given one part of the story. And at the University of Mississippi, we can't hide from our history. Mm -hmm. When people say Ole Miss, one of the first things we think of is James Meredith. So because of that. And James Meredith, just so that our listeners will know, was an African-American man that was turned away from admitted, getting admitted to the University of, um, uh, uh, University of Mississippi back, I can't remember the year, but it had to be late, late 50s, 60s. Yeah, it was 61. Um, and the, the, the thing about Mr. Meredith is that it forced a showdown between the governor of the state of Mississippi, Ross Barnett, and JFK, who was lukewarm at best on civil rights, right, um, over whether or not the federal government would protect James Meredith's right to be admitted to the state's flagship institution. It culminated in literally a battle between federal marshals and local people, and two people were killed. It's called the last battle of the Civil War by many, right? So it's like, wait a minute. The history department at Ole Miss emphasized Southern history and civil rights history, and I was lucky enough to learn so much more. And I think what fuels my passion is the desire to ensure that my students know more about these topics than I did at their age. Because the mind once enlightened cannot return again to darkness. Once you know, you know. Or, you know, to paraphrase a famous lyric, if you don't know, now you know, right? Mm -hmm. Once you know, you know. And no sense of historically revisionist nonsense can turn us away from the fact that no, this is part of America's history. And if it makes you feel comfortable, I question our common humanity. It's not supposed to make you feel comfortable. Lynching is the most uncomfortable thing I have ever read and my minor field was in Nazi Germany, Weimar Nazi Germany, right? The things that happened there were horrific and I'm not into the horrific Olympics, but when you read about first person accounts of lynching, and the state of Florida, between 1890 and 1930, led the nation in per capita lynchings. We were part of the deep, deep South. And culturally speaking, in many ways, still are. So once you understand what a lynching was, that is not, it's not my job as an educator to make you feel comfortable or to tell the other side of lynching. There is no other side. When you're looking at right and wrong and evil, there is no other side of dehumanization and brutality against other people. There's no other side to that. History is about understanding through chronology, through fact, through primary sources, and that relates to our current misinformation problem that we have as a country. Primary sources, don't listen to what I say, don't listen listeners, to what Mr. Pettis says. Go back to the sources themselves and let them tell you what they say. If it's not about race, then how can you describe a lynching through this prism that uses terms like beast, like animal, the N-word? You can't. History forces us to call it for what it is when we use the primary sources. So, why do we emphasize that? To understand how the past continues to inform the present. Amen. Whether exactly. or not you agree that what happens to Trayvon Martin, that what happens to George Floyd, that what happens to so many people across this nation is a lynching, you can't have that discussion unless you know historically what a lynching is. The past informs the present. Why do we have laws that we have on the books? There's a historical precedent. There are historical reasons for it. And that's one of the things, you know, bringing us back to the reality of critical race theory, that was what its main practitioner, Derek Bell, said, that you can't understand white flight 
in private academies without understanding the legacy of school integration, which goes all the way back to pre-Brown v. Board. So knowing our history, and I don't buy the old, you know, cliche that those who don't remember the past are doomed to repeat it. We repeat our mistakes all the time, and we should know better. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I think, Mr. Pitts, uh, Mr. Pettis, what we um, sometimes fall into is that we learn from the past that we learn little from the past. And some people want it to keep it that way. Right. You know, you, you uh, earlier indicated just being informed about these topics and how you teach your students uh, the whole history because you want them to be more informed than you were. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the epic center of the fear of those that are trying to keep history out. Because if we create an informed generation, then we have an opportunity to move forward in more humane harmony. People don't want harmony in many instances. They want divide because that's the way politic is played in this country. It's divide. Uh, that's why nobody can go across the aisle anymore. Uh, if there's a Republican good idea, the Democrats can't go. If there's a Democratic good idea, the Republicans can't go. And the loser is society, the that's citizen right. of, of the country. But they don't want people to be informed because when you get informed, you become enlightened and you can pick up what's happening because you know your history and you see a repeat coming up. Uh, I think that's at the core of the whole critical race theory uh, uh, effort here, twisting CRT to keep the truth, the facts out of the classroom so these kids won't know uh, their history. That's a great point. I, you know, I think that one of the values of history as a discipline is that when done right, it teaches empathy, mm -hmm. right? That even though I can't understand your struggle, because I'm not a black man living in South Florida practicing the law, I can at least understand the obstacles that are put in front of you that you've overcome and you continue to deal with on a daily basis, right? History teaches empathy. And in an age of political divide, the last thing we want is to have empathy for people who are not like us. That's why demonizing other Americans who are of different political beliefs is dangerous to our democracy. And that's what CRT does, right? If you teach anything in this vein and it's defined by the person who's demonizing it, then you are this list of adjectives that starts with un-American. When we start demonizing other Americans because we disagree on policy and can't compromise and look for common ground, that's dangerous for the Republic. And that's where we are. And that's what scares me. Because what these folks say critical race theory is, is absolutely inaccurate. And it's intentionally inaccurate. So that it allows others to demonize people who try to have an accurate description of what it is. And that's, look, one of the, the, the most startling realizations uh, that I've had, Mr. Pettis, was when in Brevard County, I was invited to give a lecture on this topic based on what I'd endured. And it was called Critical Race Theory, What It Is, What It Isn't. Brevard County is ground zero for some of these really disturbing movements that we're seeing in law enforcement and school boards and local leadership. Well, I was told when I arrived that the Moms for Liberty group were invited to hear from a scholar what it is, what it isn't. And the quote was, but don't worry, we have two plainclothes police officers in the audience in case things get a little crazy. And I thought in the United States of America, we have to have plain clothes officers to prevent a discussion of educational and intellectual ideas. That that's where we are. Yeah. That's where we are, and that's frightening. You know, I, I mentioned before we went on air 
uh, I went to the University of Florida, graduated in political science and English. Uh, and one of the things I loved about political science was just an open conversation on so many worldly topics uh, with people that some of them I didn't agree with, but I heard their perspective. And you grew up to respect other people's opinions, and you can use your 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 uh, skills of persuasion and put your argument forth, and they can do the same. And we get through the the conversation, and we come back tomorrow, and we're still classmates. Uh, somehow in our society, it seems like we are getting away from the ability, as you've just reflected, of just having a transparent, open conversation uh, through which this is what Can We Talk 360 was birthed from. It was birthed after uh, uh, George uh, was killed up in uh, uh, Minneapolis. And I sat down and I said, how can we as, as a civilized society allow this type of thing to happen? And, and, and we say that we didn't allow it to happen, but we made it comfortable enough that uh, the police officer was comfortable in broad daylight, in broad daylight seeing people videotape him to believe that that was okay. That's how we've made it comfortable. Uh, that if we hadn't made it comfortable and he appreciated the consequences, he wouldn't have done it in the daylight on the main thoroughfare of that city. He would have done it, you know, in the dark. But he was so comfortable till he did it right in front of all of those eyewitnesses. And Can We Talk 360 was born out of bringing people together from the business community, from all walks of life, to have conversations on tough topics and to educate people on the tough topics, uh, such as what we're, we're, we're doing today, uh, because we've gotten away from facts matter. Uh, we've gotten away from being empathetic toward each other. We've gotten away from appreciating, and you mentioned it, your walk in Alabama growing up, uh, and my walk here in Fort Lauderdale, in the, I, born in 1960 through 60 through 78, I, I, I was on the bus going to uh, schools desegregated and having the N-word screamed out at me every morning. Uh, I fought through that stuff. I then went to the University of Florida, and it changed my life. I, was, I became, you know, president, I mean, a, a treasurer of the student body, Hall of Fame, et cetera because of the fact that I didn't allow those struggles to limit me, I was educated to a better society. And I just felt it was incumbent upon me to play that role. How do we magnify your effort to have a wholesome dialogue in our educational system so there's hope for the next generation? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, I, I'll tell you what, when I, when I develop the answer, I'll tell you, you can publicize it and we can become really famous. <laughs> um, I, I think by hearing perspectives and asking questions are two really important tools that we have to use. But that's so hard to do when people don't want to hear the answer or they don't, they don't want to have the conversation. I think number one, I mean, it's a, it's a simple answer, but I, I, I think it's the right one. First thing we have to do is to put people in local elected positions who are willing to have these conversations, right? It, all politics are local. It starts with our local elections and being educated as voters on what their perspectives are on these divisive topics. Um, you know, you were talking about some of the things that we've lost in society today. And what, what I've seen is a, a mis not just a lack of respect for experts, but a mistrust of expertise. And what I mean by that is that when I've had these conversations with people before in public forums, Mr. Pettis, that one of the things that has come up is, yeah, of course you're gonna say that you're a liberal professor. 
well, why am I a liberal professor? Because that's how it is at the universities. Okay. Yeah, that bastion of liberalism that is the University of Mississippi, number one. Uh, number two, I can barely get my students to do the reading, much less indoctrinate them, right? It's about an education. It's not about indoctrination. I'm not here to tell people what to think. I'm here to teach them how to think. But if just because I'm a professor and have dedicated literally my whole life and have gone through years of training to know this, these facts, if that makes me, as one person said, part of the problem, then we've lost our way. When I go into a cardiologist's office or a lawyer's office or to an auto repair shop, I operate based on their knowledge and expertise. I don't say, well, you know what? I, I disagree with you. There are two sides to this whole uh, blocked valve heart issue that I'm having. Uh, and I think I'm just going to do what I want to do. And, you know, because I read something on the internet that contradicts you. No, you know, it, it, if I hear this funny sounds from my engine, I'm going to listen to my mechanic. I'm not going to want to believe what I want to believe because I know that I'm going to end up losing my car. It's the same thing when it comes to these important divisive issues. Listen to the experts. They know more than you do. And if they don't, and that says a lot about their training, <laughs> it, it, quite honestly. So, yeah, there, there's this baked in lack of trust and expertise that's also a problem. Um, but I, I think, you know, back to your original question, what can we do? Continue to have the conversations. Make sure that we're informed voters and that we participate in the political process. And don't lose a chance to tell the truth. When people are out here lying about the past or lying about society or lying about things that you know are a lie, point out that that's incorrect and tell them where you got the information from. We suffer as a society when we don't correct information that we know is wrong. Um, and the other thing that, you know, I, for all the listeners that I, I sort of remind myself of often is that you never know which seeds you plant will later bear fruit. You know, a comment here, a conversation here, although you may seem to think that that was futile, that it's, that it went nowhere, you don't know what impact that's going to have. Um, I have professors that I remember who said things to me that really mattered that they didn't remember. I still, I have students that say, I remember when, and they, and I don't remember it. So, you know, one of the long-term consequences of being able to speak truth to power is you never really know which seeds you plant will later bear fruit. So it's worth having the conversation, even though it may seem that there's no immediate payoff. So true, I, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, one of the, you know, we've talked about uh, critical race theory and, and Florida is epic center of that, um, this whole uh, campaign, if you will. Arizona is another place among many others. The Kamar Bell's United Shades of America that I, uh, I referenced a little earlier that was on CNN this past uh, Sunday is a worthwhile viewing. Uh, it's very well done, started in Arizona, and uh, he looks around the country, including references to the uh, uh, state of Florida with Governor DeSantis, as well as uh, other, other states. But it was a clip that he showed from President Trump at a rally and was calling uh, critical race theory, and he termed it divisive, exclusionary, and hateful. Those were his words. Uh, that he's telling his audience that critical race theory is this divisive, exclusionary, and hateful. And the quote, and I want to be accurate, he then went on to say, getting CRT out of our schools is a matter of national survival. I had said earlier, national security. It's national survival. If we don't get this out, the America that you know it's going to be taken away from you. It's it's that's the 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 
statement. That's what they're trying to talk about indoctrination. That's what they're trying to get their people to believe that somehow CRT is leading to America being taken away from them uh, because of the fact that we talk about our history. Uh, and 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 at last time I checked, uh, Wall Street and corporate America was still heavily white male dominated uh, as far as the CEOs. The wealth of this country is, is, is heavily in the hands of, of, of white America. Um, uh, are there some specks of change? I would hope so. But, but this radical belief that everything's being taken away is a tool that's used to stir fear. Uh, fear in our society to do something to keep and the term that was not by mistake, make America great again, going backwards, uh, is all tied into those, those thematic uh, messages. What, what, what do you, when you have a former president of the country creating such a dog whistle, such as this is a matter of national survival to get this boogeyman CRT uh, out of our schools, how do we counter that? Wow. Um, <laughs> how do we counter that? Truth. Uh, pointing out the, the illogic in someone who is the most privileged white male, arguably, to ever hold the office, saying that the country's being taken away from you, his supporters. If the country's being taken away, how did you get elected? This, none of this makes any logical sense. Um, and it doesn't make any factual sense either, Mr. Pettis, because the definitional theft of what CRT is, what it represents, and what the outcomes will be are being misrepresented intentionally for political purposes. Is America changing? Yes. Demographically, we are changing. And that Fear of change, you know, that that inspires, you mentioned fear, I'll also throw in hate. It also intensifies hate. And the reason is, we have had our Department of Homeland Security say that the greatest threat to our stability is not outsiders, it's white nationalists. And we don't call racism for what it is, white racist hate groups individuals acting as lone wolf predators because of the fear that white replacement is a thing. If you know history, you also understand that this white replacement theory is something that's long and it never leads to anything good, right? So again, you have to stay focused on the facts, not alternative facts, not facts that only one side can produce, but facts chronological, tangible evidence that refutes some of the nonsense that is out there. And that, you know, like I said, the other thing too is um, it's hard to reason with unreasonable people. But it is my obligation to try. And that's all we can do. I resist and this is something that I have to remind myself of you know when you talk about what we can do or, or, or should do don't demonize people in a way that they dehumanize you that's gosh that's so hard to do but if you dehumanize people you think that they are somehow above redemption um, or beyond redemption, or immune to truth. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're just misinformed, angry. A, a return to, again, what you said, an emphasis on historical fact is one way to begin this conversation and maybe crack the door open just a little bit and that's why demonizing the teaching of our history, honestly, 
is one of the things that has become a political tactic today. If you can whitewash, quite literally, the teaching of our past, and you can say that the teaching of our past leads people to hate each other, then that is one important avenue for understanding and seeking common ground that is shut down. And it has a detrimental effect, not just now, but also in the future. Our state has a teacher shortage crisis. And I've had this semester because of the political atmosphere and because of what happened to me, students who were going, some of our best students who were history majors who wanted to teach say, I don't want to go into teaching. You know, today's boogeyman might be gone next year. Is this what I'm going to have to deal with as a teacher? And, you know, it's only going to, number one, it's going to exacerbate our teacher shortage in the state. And it's also going to put people who aren't as qualified in the classrooms to teach subjects that they're not qualified to teach. So this absolutely, this demonizing of teaching the past, honestly, and by state standards, by the way, because we have state standards, Demonizing that is going to cause long-term consequences for the education of our children in public schools, and that's that's scary. I am going to end this episode, but as I told you, the conversation is much too large for one uh, communication, so I'm going to have you to come back for a part two uh, because there are other questions that I want to talk about. I think you have an incredible depth of knowledge, vision on this topic, and it needs to be heard. So I truly thank you for coming uh, and joining me in, on Can We Talk 360. I'm going to um, uh, continue this conversation with you so that we can, we can uh, talk about some other component parts to it. And uh, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I always appreciate the opportunity to have these really hard, difficult discussions um, and hope that your listeners have enjoyed the time we've spent together as well. The law firm of Hallitzer, Pettis & Schwamm is a proud sponsor of the Can We Talk 360 podcast. Our firm handles medical malpractice, wrongful death, catastrophic personal injury litigation, and workers' compensation matters. We pride ourselves in being advocates for justice on behalf of those who have been seriously injured. For decades, we've taken the lead in making your case our priority. It's who we are, it's who we'll always be. Hallitzer, Pettis and Schwamm, serious injuries, proven results. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Can We Talk 360? I sincerely hope that you were inspired to seize this moment in time and take real action towards change. Remember, all change begins with a conversation. Be sure to tune in every month for more fascinating discussions and motivational food for the soul. Please share with your friends, family, and colleagues. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Can We Talk 360 and visit us on the web at www.canwetalk360.com.